Uh, thanks, Kevin, and, and thanks for the opportunity. And in fact, on that part, um, when you first asked me if I had anything to talk on, I started researching and looking at AI, and I work in the technology field um, for, a, um, uh, for a US company. My job's actually based in Silicon Valley, and a lot of my colleagues are actually uh, in Massachusetts, where a lot of the research and, and stuff has been uh, done. Um, and uh, I was amazed to find out how much is happening and how in much impact is all around. So a couple of weeks ago, I was supposed to present, and uh, um, for those who don't know, my, my wife had a car crash um, uh, at about 4.30 as I was getting ready to sort of uh, pack up and get cleaned up and come to here. Uh, she's fine. Um, but I asked Kevin if I could then split this into two sections because of the, how much information. So that exact question of can we actually create a, uh, a, a mind, uh, I'm only going to allude to tonight because tonight's going to be everything about what's here and now. Because a lot of the, and a lot of the reason is that without talking about what's here and now and happening right now, it's very hard to consider whether that question of can we create something that's so sophisticated or can't we, it's very, very difficult to actually analyse that. Um, so I wanted to try and lay the foundation about uh, where we are what are the considerations today? And let me, there, let me say they're significant. Um, and and uh, lay that as a, the foundation for the larger question, which is an apologetic question as well. Like, if we can create a mind, do we create a self? And, and let me touch on that at the end, because I have a couple of things to whet this uh, appetite, hopefully, and get invited back for, uh, for part two. Um, but so I, that's sort of the introduction, but here's the, almost the premise. I listened to a Premier Christian Radio podcast a little while ago and, and a number of things, like the number of, of university and, um, uh, yeah, thanks, Kevin's going to advance the slides for us. This is a synchronised presentation. Um, uh, ne uh, next slide, please, Kevin. All oh, right, okay. Thanks. Um, so as I've been listening to an enormous amount of um, uh, research uh, material. Um, there's an enormous amount of lectures and university lectures uh, for artificial intelligence, uh, a lot of public forums and stuff that are actually online. And there's just a smattering, just a tiny smattering of Christian content. And uh, I listened to this one on Premier Christian Radio a little while ago. Uh, Nigel Cameron's a uh, researcher and, uh, uh, and a theologian out of, the, uh, out of some Washington think tank. They had him on Premier Christian Radio. And he's written a book uh, basically entitled The Robots Are Coming But The Church Isn't Ready. And I thought that captures what I want to start telling you about. Um, because that's, that's really uh, the idea is to start raising the awareness. And here around AI, we're all in this together. This is both a secular conversation that the church needs to engage itself in, I believe. And, but also it's uh, an opportunity for us to engage with our secular friends, colleagues, workmates, um, to say, hey, you know what? You actually need religion because, the, and AI is going to give you some really good uh, reasons for, um, or insights as to why you do. So I think this can be a conversation opener for us. Um, it's, a pretty, uh, it's a pretty brief agenda in terms of, uh, next slide please, Kevin. Um, it's a pretty brief agenda in terms of, uh, um, uh, I just want to give an intro and give you an idea of the breadth of um, how pervasive AI is around you today and has been for a while. Um, and then I want to get straight into the ethical implications by considering two or three areas of, of, of implications of AI today. And then I want to touch on part two, that exactly the question that, that uh, um, uh, Kevin raised, which is, uh, you know, can we? What, what's the, the narrative and, and what are the details about can we actually create it? an artificial general intelligence, a human level intelligence. And then, and this part's lame, and this is where I'm hoping to start dialogue and to really learn myself, but some initial thoughts on how to respond, because uh, at the end of the day, I don't know exactly what we should be doing. Um, probably not what you wanted to hear, but it's, but it's also truthful. Um, there's a premise that I've got for this talk this evening, is that the pace of change is increasing. Uh, I've been asking a lot of friends when they thought the, the iPhone was first announced, the first smartphone. And, uh, and some people have been saying, oh, 15 years, 20 years. Uh, in fact, it's around about 10 years. 
And if you think of how profound that change has been, the smart, actually having smartphones for our relationships, for our work, for whether, whenever we get in the car, whenever we listen to sport, whenever we communicate with each other, for what it's done to our business, for our communities. And frankly, for any of you who sort of tend to fact check your pastor every now and then, like me in church, you know, <laughs> even, for our, even for our theology, exactly. So my premise uh, is that um, uh, AI is actually increasing the pace of change. And if you think of what happened in 10 years, my assertion is that we're, going to, we're already starting to see greater change in, in the next 10 years than we have in the previous 10. Um, so what is artificial intelligence? Uh, basically intelligence displayed by man-made machines, or if you like, created machines, um, instead of that which is found in the natural world. Um, and that's a whole philosophical discussion right there. Um, let's just for this evening go with the um, definition of... Uh, oh, sorry, next slide, please. Kevin? I thought you wanted me to click on the link. Uh, sorry, no, just next slide. Sorry, I'll try and remember. Um, I was trying it with that. Uh, it didn't work. But, um, uh, or artificial intelligence. Let's go with the, the, the second definition from 1957. Uh, this is also sourced from Wikipedia. Um, but artificial intelligence is that that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So this should tell you immediately that computers are learning. That actually says that they're manipulating their own data and uh, most likely also their own code. That's a really, really important point. I, uh, I listened to our Chief Justice a little while ago um, uh, she'd come back from a, a UN conference on lethal autonomous weapons and she was talking about who was responsible. Would it be the commander? Would it be the politician? Would it be the programmer? And when she said, would it be the programmer, I realised she didn't realise, she didn't understand that these things are writing their own code. We'll get to that. They're the premises. Um, and just uh, also by way of a little bit more of an idea of what AI is, You've heard, I've just introduced a concept of, of uh, learning and the machine writing its own code. So there's a, a cognitive ability here. Um, but there's also the other things that we do to help us be smart um, is our perceptions, uh, all, of our, all of our five senses and, and more. And image, speech, uh, our spatial awareness, where my hand is, relation to my body, where I am, relation to the table and to you. Um, and, uh, and we use our perceptions to also do something uh, that is very difficult for machines. We do modelling of the world, uh, easily demonstrated. We see we're driving along in our cars and we see the ball come out into the middle of the road. What are we all waiting for? We're waiting for the kid that's chasing, uh, chasing the ball, right? Do you know how incredibly hard that is to actually impart or teach to a machine? And so what the researchers now are, are trying to do is actually do some rudimentary modelling using those perceptions um, and to try and do prediction like we do naturally. Um, and this is obviously a big thing in driverless cars and things like that, so you can try and avoid um, collisions. Um, I'll make this point a number of times, but AI today... Next slide, please, Kevin. That's it. Oh, uh, oops. Yeah, next slide. AI is um, uh, AI today is really, really broad. You've been using it for years because it's been keeping at least uh, uh, most of the uh, junk mail and the spam mail out of your uh, out of your inbox. Um, but increasingly, it's being used by everything that you interact with. Um, cars today, the typical motor vehicle today has around a, about a hundred thousand lines of code in it. Um, uh, it's being used for surgery, increasingly. Um, um, uh, robotics. Um, I'm going to say probably a couple of times, go and Google Boston Dynamics uh, if you want to see what robots can do. Robots doing backflips. Uh, robots um, uh, doing very, very fine motor work. Um, as I say, I'm in the field and it's been a real eye-opener uh, to me. So. My point here is that AI is broad, and next slide please, Kevin. And AI is already change, causing changes around us. And changes in our conversations. 
Um, it's actually already starting to impinge on the legal field where a lot of paralegal work is, um, uh, sorry, a lot of parallel, I've got to be careful what I say here, try and be precise. There are a lot of applications coming on the market, especially to do paralegal and repetitive type work. Um, there are uh, applications to help disabled people. There, but it's also changing our narrative. Like things like um, a church in, in California, of course California, um, uh, has actually been started up. Uh, we might as well worship AI gods now before we create them so that it's a nice, easy transition for us. And there's an enormous amount of press on this. It's got a lot of discussion. Is it fanciful? Sure. Is it causing discussion? Absolutely. And in fact, you know, even the Pope's actually um, uh, commented on it about how we should be thinking about developing AIs. And um, uh, in uh, some of the recent Christian debates I've actually heard between um, uh, secularists and apologists, uh, they're debating human rights, which Andrew talked to us a little while ago, and they're saying, hang on, our human rights, not based on, uh, on Christianity, is actually more inclusive because what, if, what about aliens and what about AIs that we're creating? And you're going, am I really listening to this? And the thing is that people are taking it seriously, um, as evidenced by the EU saying, hey, maybe we'll have to give personhood status to robots. Really? You've got to be kidding. So my point is that even the future dialogues are having an impact on today. I'd just give you some really quick examples. Amazon Go, I thought it was a really advanced supermarket uh, in Seattle. You basically put down your mobile phone, you walk in, everything is completely automated. There's, there's nobody around except apparently some folks out the back making pizza and cutting sandwiches. And everything is done with AI. You track the moment you go in there, you basically pull your things off the shelf, you walk out. There's, there's not a case of, oh, will I go through the auto teller or will I do the self-service? There's no service. You just walk out and everything's actually uh, on your uh, account on your iPhone and you're done. And you want to put something back, you put it back. Now, I thought Amazon was actually ahead of the curve here until I found out about bingo box. And these bingo boxes are like on the runs, uh, popping up in all the major cities in China. And they're completely AI and they're like a, an on the run, completely automated. And, uh, and completely AI driven. And by the way, I'm using two things a little bit interchangeably here. AI and automation go hand in hand. They're distinct, but they are very linked because wherever you get AI, you get automation. Um, so AI does imply automation. Um, medical imaging, there's a raft of, of, of imaging apps either on, uh, uh, medical imaging and diagnosis apps either on the market, and IBM is a big player here. I watched a video from IBM the other day where in China they present oncology cases to all of the oncologists within the hospital, and they use IBM Watson uh, to actually um, uh, also uh, contribute to the diagnosis and the patient care, and they're saying they have significant better patient outcomes. Um, smartphone apps, where you can take a uh, and there's a number of these, but this one's from Intel, and I'm just trying to show you that it's sort of real by using the, by using the company names that you might recognise. And um, uh, you take a photo of your lesion, and it basically goes back and it, and, and it compares using AI, which is learned to classify, right? It's learned to classify from uh, tens of thousands, in case of the Intel app right now, but potentially hundreds of thousands or millions of images between what's a cancerous lesion and what's a non-cancerous lesion. And you ask yourself, well, how long is it going to be before this is more reliable than a dermatologist? Because a dermatologist is actually limited by the amount of images they can see in their lifetime. And a computer can actually do these in seconds, hundreds of, and, and hundreds of thousands or millions of images. So you can, I'm trying to paint there the potential of the power of just that imaging uh, and AI together. And um, uh, it, gets, it, gets, uh, it gets even a little bit more profound and even a little bit more close to home. Um, Stanford uh, University, just up the road from where uh, our offices are, or used to be in California, um, uh, I used to work for Sun Microsystems, Stanford University Networks, right? So um, uh, they've actually been looking at mortality prediction for two, for two reasons. 
One is because a lot of terminally ill patients want to die at home and there's very few of them get to do so. So they want to actually predict the end of life for those patients so they can send them home at the right time. And secondly, um, for, to get enough stats from the medical data, so it, the AI uses the data, it applies the AI learning algorithms and it creates the knowledge from that data, and that's the point, it creates the, the knowledge from the data, and it's able to say, okay, here are the people that are actually risk of sudden death. Now, I don't know if anybody fo uh, follows cycle racing, but there was a guy that actually died um, very, very suddenly in the Paris-Roubaix uh, uh, bike race uh, during the week. That's the sort of thing they want to try and intervene on. And much more locally, the University of Adelaide is doing the same sort of research. From your CT scans, they'll tell you um, if you, your likelihood of mortality within the next five years to about 67%. 67% is pretty low. But that's only because they haven't got enough images. Wait till they actually get more images. Okay, I, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm making the, the point about the breadth of, of, of applications and a little bit about the mechanics of how this is uh, starting to happen and why there's so much investment. But why now? I gave you a quote about artificial intelligence from 1957. Um, so why in the last four or five years is all of a sudden this field seem to have been exploding. And there's about four or five reasons that have all come together at the same time. Uh, one is the amount of computer power that we actually have and the availability of that computer power. Uh, what I mean by that is the fact that our, um, the, the power of our, of our chips and of our software and hardware systems has, uh, sorry, of our hardware systems has actually been increasing exponentially since about 1985 or the mid-1980s. And that's something that is known as Moore's Law. About every 18 months, computer performance is, uh, uh, doubles. Now, that's been flattening off in recent times. Um, but I, I saw um, uh, from the uh, Computer Electronics Show uh, late last year that Intel had actually announced their 49 qubit quantum bit uh, chip. And they put that on the cloud. That's the other thing that's actually happening. You used to have to get computer power, you used to have to have access to a big mainframe. Then of course it was on our PCs. But all of our PCs are disconnected. Where they're all islands. Now everything's happening in the cloud. So if you want to go and get a massive amount of computer power, just like NASA does, they go and get Amazon and uh, their own local stuff and Microsoft Cloud all at the same time to run scientific, some scientific experiment and then they close it all down and they're done. Um, that sort of massive computer power enables the algorithms for AI to actually run efficiently. That couldn't happen 10 or 15 years ago. There's also um, the gamers. The folks are, are, are um, doing all the computer games have actually added to it because uh, uh, graphics processor units turn out to be just perfect for running uh, artificial intelligence algorithms as well. Um, and then there's the availability of the data. I said to you earlier that you, know, you can look at a, a lesion, take an image of a lesion and know whether it's cancerous or not. And the more and more images you have, the better off the diagnosis is. So now the amount of data we have and are capturing and generating on the planet is just uh, incredible. Um, uh, everything we have and own pretty much is getting connected to the internet. Uh, the, you might have heard of the, um, uh, the internet of things, uh, um, but everything we're putting in has a, has a sensor. My watering system has a, uh, is connected to the internet. So when there's a uh, showers, it doesn't actually, uh, it's connected to the Bureau of Meteorology so that it doesn't water on those days or it waters half. We're connecting everything to the internet and that's generating an enormous amount of data which can then be analysed for knowledge. Facebook, Google, um, uh, Amazon, uh, Twitter, all of our social media where we're also putting our human uh, data is also adding an enormous amount of uh, data for AIs to then create knowledge out of. Um, and, oh, and this just because it's fun and because it's Australia, um, I don't know if those of you have heard of the Square Kilometre Array. It's going to be the, the Earth's largest radio telescope and it's being built between the desert in uh, Western Australia 
and uh, in South Africa, out in the desert in South Africa, and it's run out of Cambridge University. And the folks from Cambridge say that they're going to generate about a zettabyte uh, of data every six hours. Now, I don't have uh, a chance to show you how big a zettabyte is. Uh, take my word, that's a lot of data. They claim it's more data than the human race has actually created since uh, in, in recorded history. Um, why now? Collaboration. If you compare what's happening with AI now to the Human Genome Project, um, again, you're getting rid of the islands of data and all of the researchers are able to collaborate. All of the algorithms, or many of the algorithms for doing AI are actually available free of charge on the, on the internet. There's projects that are sponsored by large companies called OpenAI. Um, TensorFlow, I think, is from one of the uh, social media companies. And anybody can pick this up. And by the way, you don't need to be a real guru to use this stuff. You might need it to uh, create a car. You might need to be a good engineer. But to drive a car, you just need to be careful. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, anyway, and the other, uh, uh, another thing driving why now, why this is exploding, and why this pace of change is increasing, are the advances in neuroscience. With, with, with um, the imaging, um, uh, brain imaging and brain modelling that's being done, uh, that's actually, oh, uh, sorry, back one please, just for a sec. Yep, thank you. Um, uh, uh, with uh, the amount of imaging that's being done and the amount that we're starting to actually understand about the human brain, by the way, don't get too concerned about that because the more we learn, the more we realise we need to learn. Um, uh, but those discoveries and some of those, those imaging things are coming back into AI and they're actually helping to inform the AI design of the algorithms. And you can see what I've also done here, try also, uh, importantly, I've tried to put links through all my slides to all my source material. Um, so you can go back and read uh, the, much of the stuff that I'm actually claiming and, and reveal for yourself. And I will post these slides either if we have a location a reasonable faith or I'll put them on slide share. Um, next slide please, Kevin. Yeah. Like a lot of R&D and engineering, why now? Money. Money is an incentive. Um, uh, follow the money. China has said that they will not be left uh, in second place with AI. Um, and China has gone to great, uh, great lengths to make sure that the, their data which I said is used by AI to be turned into knowledge, um, stays with China. A great example of this is, um, uh, is the fact that they bought out Uber in China a number of years ago because the Chinese were not prepared to have the Americans know about the ride-sharing details of the, US, of the Chinese citizens. And, that, um, and in, in, in light of what's happened the last couple of weeks, which I'll talk about, that looks like a pretty prudent decision if you're a Chinese. Um, the US tech companies are slurping up all of our graduates. Anybody who knows about AI, and if you've got any kids that are actually wondering what to do, AI is a good bet for the next 10 or 20 years beyond that, um, I don't know. But anybody who knows anything about the AI al algorithms are being slurped up by the US tech companies and by defence and government. Um, uh, we know this because the Department of Defence is actually telling us. They've actually been quite public about it and you can read their papers and see what they're uh, uh, investigating. Well, you can see some of what they're investigating. Um, a number of people have said, yeah, but you know, some people say there's not going to be that much of a, of a change. If you look at the spending, um, just take IDC, International uh, Data Corporation, which is one of the um, market research companies that a lot of uh, folks like uh, my company and uh, IBM and, uh, and Microsoft, the, the, the large um, US tech companies will, will use and contribute to, um, they're basically estimating around about a $57 billion market for AI applications um, by 2021. And all of the venture capitalists are basically um, uh, lending money for AI projects, whereas a while ago they were actually lending them for, you know, internet projects or internet of things projects. Uh, now it's all going for uh, AI. Okay. Um, 
This is to touch on what Kevin was asking. Uh, I hope by now I've sort of given you some idea that there's a breadth to AI. Um, it's happening now a pace um, and why it's happening uh, so rapidly and things are changing so rapidly and developing so rapidly. Um, here I want to try and give some context on where we are. What I've got is an attempt to show you that uh, there's a curve here from sort of uh, automation and robotics and AI and, and uh, deep learning, uh, machine learning and the existing algorithms, um, uh, deep neural networks uh, is one of the AI techniques. Uh, these existing technologies um, and there's a long way to go which is sort of the purpose of my, uh, of my second green box there. With those existing technologies we're going to make quite a big difference yet without any other big technical breakthroughs on the algorithms or in neuroscience or anything else. Um, just implementing on what we already have. Um, and if you listen to most of the narratives from the AI researchers, from any of the university professors, uh, if you listen to the forums where the physicists are talking, um, then there's an expectation that we will get to human level artificial general intelligence. What do I mean? So um, have you heard of the AlphaGo that beat uh, Lisa Dahl at the, uh, at the Go program or, or the Deep Blue that uh, beat uh, Gary Kasparov at chess? That's very, very powerful artificial intelligence, but it's very, very narrow. So I can't get AlphaGo, the Go playing AI, to actually do my maths homework or to help me make a cup of tea or to do my accounts. It's very, very powerful, but extremely narrow. Yet us humans, with all of our cognitive abilities and all of our perceptions and our senses, um, we are generally intelligent. And that's normally the time I'd make a football joke, but I'll resist. Um, uh, and uh, um, that's what the expectation and the whole narrative, particularly in the circular world, well, it's only in the secular world because the church is not really involved, um, uh, that we will get there. Now, here's the rub. It's expected that when we get there, we'll, we'll, we'll cure diseases and we'll do lots of good things. We'll fix climate change. We'll, um, uh, we'll do all these wonderful things. But there is also at the same time this recognition that maybe um, it, because this is computers and we can replicate and one AI can learn for its, from another AI, that in fact this might become exponential intelligence very quickly. So we could find ourselves as um, behind in intelligence to a super intelligent AGI, artificial general intelligence, as we are to say an earthworm. And there are alarm bells being raised about that. This gives us an opportunity, um, those of us in the church, um, uh, to actually have conversations with those outside about why some of the, the, the um, basis for our worldview is actually important for uh, this narrative. And I'll touch on that just at the end. So back to the, so I hope that just gives a little bit of perspective about where this is headed, but we're firmly in the, in the bottom left hand corner. Next slide please, Ken. So, I want to just touch on the implications for the, uh, of where we are today for the next, say, um, 15 minutes. And um, uh, they come under three broad headings. And the, as I say, you know, I hope to talk to you uh, at a later date about the theological and philosophical, um, uh, but, but that is really a whole uh, talk in itself and it's, and it's very, very important. Um, but it comes after this one. Um, so let's talk about the ethics and the implications, both economic and societal, from automation and AI, uh, the ethics of the use of AI, and also the ethics that are intrinsic to AI. What I mean by intrinsic? Well, general, genuine, generally, technology and engineering 
um, is amoral. It's without morals, right? Um, my mobile phone um, is amoral. I can use it um, uh, for bad purposes or good purposes, right? I can, I, I can use it for either. You know, a, a, say a, a, a truck, you, you might use it to run people down or you might use it to take people to hospital in the form of an ambulance. But a cruise missile probably has an ethical dimension to it. So there are some things that actually have intrinsic um, ethics. And then, of course, there's, I want to talk about risks, uh, which is where we share, uh, those of us in the church, share uh, concerns and dialogue with, very directly with our, with our secular friends and workmates. Economics. Job losses are, uh, from AI and automation, are likely to be very significant. There is debate about how significant. There isn't debate about whether they will be significant, and there is no debate about whether the um, changes and the implications to our society will be significant. Just consider driverless cars. Now, I know that there was a, a death which is actually in Arizona a couple of weeks ago, which is actually put on hold the Uber trials in Arizona. And Uber have actually ordered, uh, uh, next slide please, Kevin. Uber have ordered 22,000 Volvos uh, late last year so they can actually take their driverless cars mainstream. And, um, uh, and uh, Waymo have already uh, gone live. They've received their license to start up their passenger service uh, in opposition to, uh, to Uber. That's already starting to happen. Now, the ABC did me a uh, favour here because late, uh, sometime last year, they had a, an article about when driverless cars might happen. So don't listen to me, but uh, you can see the Society of Automotive Engineers and Vic Roads think that we'll actually have full automatic uh, vehicles um, a decade from now, i.e. Uh, during the 2020s. So this is not 20 years away, and, and I think this is one of the things that I'd like to uh, emphasise with my premise about the rate of change increasing and my, my uh, example of the iPhone. MIT uh, is involved in a lot of the research. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we're good. Um, uh, uh, in a lot of the research and development, and a lot of the uh, robotics firms are actually coming out of uh, MIT, as well as um, places like Carnegie Mellon and um, uh, Stanford, uh, um, and there's a couple of other uh, Arizona, I think. There's a couple of other really big ones. Oxford and Cambridge fe feature as well, um, but. Um, the Technology Review is an MIT paper and uh, I was forwarded the, an article on the top left that basically tech companies should stop uh, pretending that AI won't destroy jobs. Well, one of the things that I find is that people who are saying that AI won't have a significant impact on jobs are those people who have a vested interest in AI not having a significant imp uh, uh, impact on jobs yet because it might curtail their activities. It might pose the question of just because we could, should we? Um, and there's a lot of people that don't want that question asked. Uh, the ABC website has actually been doing a good job trying to raise some of the employment issues. And I highly recommend, you know, could a robot uh, take, uh, uh, t uh, do your job? And you'll be surprised already how much AI is being used in, in crime fighting. And it's way beyond surveillance. Um, it's actually where to target resources and, and, it's, and it's creating knowledge out of the crime data. Um, and we'll touch on that a little bit more in just a moment. Um, but let's just take a local example, a contemporary one from a, uh, a month ago. Uh, the NAB have just uh, uh, announced they're getting rid of 6,000 people. And, um, and they, they basically, it's entirely due to AI and automation. That's just one. And in financial services, let me tell you, that is one area where you can really substitute capital for labour. Um, we've been doing that all along as uh, computer folks. There's no, no, nothing surprising there. It's just now it's on steroids. Again, to try and... Um, uh, next slide, please, Kevin. Again, to try and take the, the question of, hey, is, you know, is this being overstated quite seriously? Um, uh, I sort of tried to look around to try and get some economic uh, indicators. And uh, here you can sort of see uh, the OECD. Um, uh, it, it, sorry, if you just pay attention to the OECD um, 
uh, bit there. They've come out with a report to say exactly that. Look, it's not going to be anywhere near as bad as what you think. We think there's only going to be 10% job loss throughout the developed world over the next decade. OK, that's not too bad. Well, actually, let's think about that. 10% is actually a significant number, and that's the low end. But then what they go on to conclude is, yeah, but there's going to be a huge amount of structural change. Now, the World Economic Forum do a really good job of addressing some of that structural change. They talk about the typical US med student who's coming out with $300,000 worth of debt. Now, if 70% of his job is being, diagnostic jobs is being done by AI and machines, um, you know, how can he pay that off as a, to quote the World Economic Forum paper, um, uh, 300 grand seems a lot to pay off as a yoga teacher. Um, and similarly, they did an analysis in Germany where they're saying, actually, you know what, the robots and our high uh, investment in robotics has not actually caused people to lose jobs because our workers are actually working with those AIs. Then they went on to say, yes, but what we do have, we don't have any of our, uh, our youth going into manufacturing anymore, they're going straight to the service jobs. And in fact, if you look at uh, global survey after global survey, you'll see the serv service jobs are actually increasing. They're the fastest sector everywhere. Um, I'll give you fitness trainers as, a, uh, as an example. A friend of mine who's a missionary, they said, well, but what about the third world? And I went, wow, that's a really good question. What about all those places where we've been offshoring jobs because it's been cheap? But here's the point. You know, I talked about natural language processing the other day, uh, early on. I said we could do speech recognition and, and text generation. This is, this is Alexa, this is Cortana, this is Siri, right? All the digital assistants. It's doing text to speech, speech to text. But our, our language translators have gotten good enough now too where you can have call centres operated by bots. So now, um, if you consider that, um, then all of a sudden an offshore job in India and call centre starts to look expensive because bots don't need a break. They work 24-7, they don't need healthcare. And in fact, the harder you work them, the cheaper they are. But who owns all these bots? Who owns the technology? Well, that's back into the rich countries where they're actually investing the technology. And by the way, this is nationalisation and trade, the prospect of trade wars add fuel to that particular fire. So the ethical question here is, hang on, shouldn't we be talking about this just bef before all of our companies start to actually take back what they'd offshored? Um, I think there's a whole conversation here to have about the side effects of replacing um, uh, labour with capital. You know, I once heard a, t a sermon from, uh, uh, sorry, next slide please. Uh, no, that's it, that's it. Thank you, Kevin. Um, you may have uh, heard, and if you haven't, uh, you will, I think you'll be hearing more and more about a universal basic wage. What's that? That's basically paying people to not work. If you like, it's the dole on steroids. And this is being talked about seriously in, in forums like the World Economic Forum, the World Bank, um, and by governments throughout the world because they're quite concerned about what's going to happen with job losses and job displacement. And um, I don't take a position on it apart from it's not a real solution. Um, and I, I base that partly on my worldview. Um, you know, I once heard a, a sermon from Tim Costello and, and he claimed that, uh, and remember, he worked with a lot of people as a, as a solicitor and, and now as his role in World Vision, and he regards employment as occupational therapy. It's part of our identity. So what do we look like if job losses are, 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 are significant and structural changes are so significant that our actually identities are being faced, uh, are being challenged and, and, uh, and changed? Um, and frankly, this is one of the reasons that the church needs to be involved because we have some answers to that, right? Uh, or I should say people of faith. And when I say church, I mean the capital C church. Um, so, you know, even just to investigate what is the meaning of work, doesn't the Christian faith tradition actually have a lot to say about that? Um, so uh, I think these are the reasons we need to be involved and actually sort of why I'm talking to you this evening. Ethics. 
in the uh, use of AI. Um, here's some great news. Here's some great news. Right? Um, you know, if we go to driverless cars, the downside is we might lose jobs. And certainly the insurance companies are already preparing for that. They're already drawing up plans for what happens when they have 50% or maybe 20% or even 10% of the road crashes that they do now. Um, why do I pluck those figures out of the air? Well, because 90% of, of road crashes are, are human error. And the irony of this is not lost on me. Um, but if, on a serious note, if you take the, the death tolls in the US per year, and it's about 1,200 in Australia, and by the way, it's been going up. Uh, recent, of late, after dipping, um, even if we made a 50% decrease, isn't that a good thing? Certainly a good thing if it's your husband or wife or daughter or son or grandchild. Um, and in fact, it's an incalculable good, right, if, it's, if it's, that's the case. Um, but also, uh, we're enabling cures for diseases. And, and AI is actually able to build knowledge. Uh, for instance, again, quoting uh, Cambridge um, uh, University, um, uh, I was lucky enough um, about uh, 14 months ago to hear from the guys in the med school and they were, they were basically saying how they used AI and, uh, and cloud together to look at their existing clinical data, their existing records and in, and in some areas they were able to actually cut down post-operative infections by 50% within three months. Um, and, and this is enormous from using existing data but applying the AI techniques. Um, some assisted living for elderly and aged populations um, uh, to actually help people who are victims of accidents or disease. Have you seen people who are actually able to walk in those suits, those, those robotic suits, and they can actually stand and they can walk? This is, this is wonderful stuff, right? Um, and... Uh, uh, look, one of my favourite apps is this uh, um, uh, Google Glass and Stanford app. It's for autistic kids. You know, one of the things they've done with AI robots is they've put a whole lot of research into picking up human emotions. By using the camera to observe you and to observe whether you're paying attention or looking at your phone, or um, they actually pick up on the emotional cues. So what the Stanford researchers have done is actually put this into Google Glass so that the autistic kids can actually get cues and vocal cues on how to interact with the people around them. What a fantastic idea. Um, that, that, just the thought of that use of technology delights me, I have to say. Um, and then uh, even my son was giving some examples. He's been building uh, chatbots with, his, uh, 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 with help from, uh, from Yen here. Um, uh, for the Philippines to help with welfare payments. And I was reading his blog and he was talking about a, uh, uh, another of his uh, colleagues that's actually building um, chatbots using natural language processing so that the farmers can just talk to their phone and get agricultural advice without having to actually learn a keypad or learn how to use the phone other than, other than uh, make a call. This is, this is great uses of technology. And, and this is really exciting. OK, you can probably tell. Um, so the, but here's the ethical question. Does this mean we've got a sort of a moral obligation? If those are the goods we can do, do we have a moral obligation to pursue AI because of the suffering that it could alleviate? Don't answer that question yet, because now it gets a bit negative. Um, there are some interesting uses of AI. I don't know if you can read this, but this is Wobot as in, you know, woe is me. And it's a Facebook application. And, um, and, and it does cognitive behavioural therapy. Basically, it's trying to be a therapist to help people who are struggling. Um, and, um, and I had a, a brief interaction with it. And, um, and you can see that it, it, um, it, it tries to personalise the conversation to make it like it was a, a human, the other end. It, the use of the I and we pronouns there. And um, but this is a really interesting question. When we're in emotional need, do we need a beating heart? Is there actually something unique about humans that needs something unique from other humans? Um, or is this actually an okay idea because it sort of 
expands the, the reach of maybe what um, uh, people who are trying to other help, help other people um, emotionally can actually do. Uh, next slide, please, Kevin. Um, and now we're continuing to spiral down, I'm afraid, and, and, and over the last couple of weeks, Mr Putin has actually um, uh, given me some, some uh, uh, evidence um, to present to you. Um, but there is an AI arms race going on because knowledge is power. And, and frankly, Mr Putin um, says it, uh, encapsulated it, um, uh, what I was going to try and convey to you. And essentially, um, uh, the leader in artificial intelligence is going to um, uh, be able to dominate. Uh, this is a scary thought after he's just actually announced a, an underwater autonomous drone. And, uh, and if you imagine an, a lethal autonomous weapon, um, so it's a weapon, uh, and imagine a drone underwater or, um, or in the sky, and uh, it can learn who, what, where, and how to target. And it doesn't need any human intervention, and it's writing its own code and learning as it goes. Um, and there's a whole set of moral issues here. There's a whole lot of UN discussions about this. There's sort of a moratorium. There's about a hundred and something uh, scientists and researchers have been, uh, have, uh, including Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk and Max Tegmark, and uh, and you can roll out all the names. Uh, that you're likely to see spruiking science or technology, and they've written uh, co-signed letters to the UN basically asking for a moratorium on lethal autonomous weapons. But I can tell you um, that there's about 30 countries actively investigating, and Mr Putin has actually done a very nice job of demonstrating for me, uh, this for me in, over the last couple of weeks. Um, and you can read more about this in the link that I've actually provided. That's a time uh, link there, but again, just go and Google it. And again, Remember, a, a lethal autonomous weapon is likely modifying or writing its own code. That's the autonomous bit here, guys. Um, it gets worse, sort of. Well, I don't know if you can get worse than lethal autonomous weapons. Maybe I should have had this in the other way, other way around. Um, but of course, the sex industry is always going to use whatever technology it can. And um, I didn't research this further than being able to tell everybody here that AI powered sex robots are getting uh, ever more human-like. And, and yes, they are making them in kid shape as well, if you want to be truly disgusted, right? Um, and to demonstrate just some of the things here, um, deep fakes and, and deep fakes with famous people like Emma Watson up here are actually AI-generated video. And the AI is now able to take an image and then generate a, either a storyline or it's able to superimpose over existing video to make whatever video you want. In this case, um, and by the way, I've got this uh, Fight the New Drug. Anybody who's interested in, in the effects of porn, particularly on our kids, sign up for Fight the New Drug. It's a campaign, a secular campaign to raise awareness of what this is doing to our kids and our families and their relationships. But just think about the power here. So the kid, the 19-year-old with his, with, his, with his mobile phone or his laptop in his bedroom can actually use these public tools to go and generate whatever fantasy he likes. Did anybody know that was possible before this evening? Honestly, you've made my... And let everybody you know know about this. Go and get them to Google deep fakes and, and porn and actually raise the awareness. Just this one thing, because our kids know and our kids can use the tool. I remember I said you don't need to be an engineer to drive the car. Well, our kids don't need to be engineers to drive this software. It's been made super easy and it's awful. I've, anyway, um, moving on. They're the uses, good and bad, of AI. Now there's the intrinsic part. And the more and more we put our decision and control making uh, abilities, the more and more we cede them to AI and to machines, uh, the more and more risks we run and the more and more ethical dilemmas we run into. Um, I don't know if you know that, uh, and in increasingly, particularly in the US, um, and this is partly motivated, I'm sure, by the fact that the US is so litigious 
including around their hiring laws. Um, uh, but AI is being used for actually filling job positions. But the really interesting thing is that there's been some notice that, uh, um, and I've got to be care uh, precise the way I say it, um, if you have bad data, you get bad outcomes. So would it be a bad outcome if all of the jobs were actually filled by uh, white, rich, uh, extremely well college educated, um, affluent um, young males? Well, hey, if the AI impartially tells us that that's the best person to the, for the job, is that the right outcome? Is that the outcome we want? So there's a lot of work going into processing the data sets and there's some engineering standards. The folks that brought you Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, IEEE, are looking at data standards to try and actually make sure that the data that goes into the AI, that the AI then produces the knowledge out of, is trying to be unbiased. But hang on, who's asking the questions? And, and, and if, the, if, it's, if the answer is, I want, I want the best person to give me the best outcome for the job, then you've got a whole conversation about what the outcome needs to be. Um, the credit card rating system in the US is also implicitly building in racial profiling. You're not allowed to use racial profiling in any form of credit, but guess what? Because it's in the AI data, and the AI is impartial, right? It's neutral, but guess what? It's embedding it as a side effect. And, and this is one of the things that the IEEE um, is actually trying to look at to try and get standards around the data. But there's a bigger problem. We're talking about masses and masses of data. So the more and more data you have, the better and better and more powerful the AI is. But you know what? That means the more and more unintelligible and unexplainable is the reason that the AI made that, that decision. So, so, so uh, let me demonstrate. There's, uh, I don't know if you've seen on, uh, on Facebook and on Google, you can, get, um, you can get, you upload your images and it'll attach a tag to them. It'll actually do some image recognition and it'll say, two cats playing with a, boy, uh, with a ball, um, uh, a child on a swing, um, two people fishing. Well, they had this one that actually was a husky dog and they wanted to research why it got labelled as a wolf. And it turns out that the classification engine um, used everything in the image uh, it gave weight to, all of the bits in the image that it, that it gave significant weight to actually make its, its, its uh, decisions were the trees, the snow, uh, the, the, uh, the logs, uh, the rocks, and they didn't end up giving that much weight to the animal itself. And you go, well, okay, who cares? Well. You care if you're in front of a judge or a parole board and, and those uh, uh, an AI is being increasingly used in the US setting um, to decide on parole decisions or on bail decisions. And now that's great because you take out some human variability like the before lunch, after lunch thing, you know, I just had, uh, I just got bitten by a dog on the way to the courthouse. You take out the emotion, great. But nobody knows how it came to this decision. And there's a great test case, and you can look at it in the New York Times article that I've got linked here, um, about somebody being sent to jail because of an algorithm, not precisely an AI algorithm, but the principle's the same. Because the developers wouldn't let them know the algorithm because that was, that was uh, uh, copyright and it was um, private and confidential. So here's somebody who's being sent to prison and, and they can't actually find out on what basis or how the decision was made. And that's what AIs are actually doing. The more and more we act, well that's a, an intrinsic problem, uh, ethical problem for how we, uh, uh, that we face when we cede control to uh, AIs. Can you force it to disclose the reason? Well, yes, and if, in, in sometimes. Uh, to, to be very careful. Um, they were able to do it with the husky and the wolf, but it took some work. Therefore, you can conclude the data set was actually manageable. But if the data set is too large, then, then nobody really knows. But it's, it's regarded as a black box problem and there's um, uh, quite a bit of research being done on it. And 
And, and certainly, it's known that the, the AlphaGo program, we cannot understand how that actually beat Lee Sedale. That's unobtainable to us. It's too complex and it's too vast. Risks. I just, I'm going to have to just sort of truncate a little bit, but uh, those scientists who rode to the UN are also warning of catastrophic failure and think of about it, think about it roughly comparable to nuclear type failure, right? We have all these safeguards with, um, uh, with our nuclear weapons because we realise how dangerous they are. And we're only just coming to the point where we're really realising how much care and concern we need to put into our, into our, um, our control systems. Um, a, a great article here, oh, next slide please, Kim, sorry, thank you. Uh, a great article here from uh, think tanks at Oxford and Cambridge was that, um, yeah, we've, look, we've looked at the risk of AI generated cyber attacks. And you know what? It's really, it's quite bad news. So, so you all know that you can have computer virus and you can see the, the fact that how much damage computer virus have, have, have done for command and control systems. And in fact, a, the great example here to, to really paint the picture is Stuxnet. Who's familiar with what Stuxnet is? Yeah, okay. So Stuxnet was a computer virus that the US um, uh, Defense Department or the U US Army or whoever, the US, were able to infect the SCADA systems, the computer systems that controlled the Iranian centrifuges, which were actually enriching their uranium. In Iran. In Iran. In Iran. Um, and um, they introduced Stuxnet, and what it did is it actually made the centrifuges spin so fast they were all damaged, and they set the uh, Iranian enrichment program back uh, many, many, many years. We don't exactly know, but that shows you the power of being able to do a computer virus in the real world. We think, oh, well, you know, I just lose some data. No, 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 no. No, no, we now lose systems. I said, every car on the road is running about 100,000 lines of code. That is increasing. And guess what? Most of those cars can be hacked, right? So there's a lot of work going in. And Microsoft um, are actually putting in a huge amount of, uh, of effort to try and eliminate some of these risks. Driverless cars. You know you can make some mods to a stop sign uh, that are absolutely imperceptible to a human being but it's enough to actually make a, uh, a driverless car not recognise it. Um, uh, investment risks. Uh, money is going into AI power and not risk mitigation. There's only some starting to go into risk mitigation now. Um, Microsoft, uh, and then there's human influences, just plain old human influences, not like even dastardly ones like the porn examples or the, or the, uh, um, you know, or the power ones. Uh, Microsoft released a, a chatbot called Tay. Within about three hours it was hijacked and it was actually spewing Nazi rants and they took that down after about three hours. It only lasted about three hours in the wild. But let me go back to, um, uh, to deep fakes for the moment and the ABC uh, had a great um, uh, article here uh, that summarises it for you on the 4th of March. Um, and the picture there is of uh, some fakes of Obama. So I said you could use Emma Watson and make your own porn video, but it's actually, it's, 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 it's actually more problematic than that. Not that that's not problematic enough. But um, uh, it's starting to get almost impossible to tell to AI-generated audio and video from recorded audio and video. Well, so the first question that, that occurs to me is, well, what happens to our standard of evidence? Where do, we get, um, where do we get real truth from if we can't use that sort of recording? Um, if our, if, and particularly at a time where we're talking about fake news, uh, AI seems to give this a, a turbocharge, this problem. And again, one of the benefits of doing this talk a couple of weeks later, I was going to talk to you about nudge theory and uh, persuasion. And this is something uh, that in fact people I know in Adelaide have been working on for years. When you go to a website 
Well, let me tell you the amount of AI and research that has gone into where every single uh, box and square and character on that website uh, is placed. There's an enormous amount of da marketing data goes into it. But I was listening uh, last year to a Veritas uh, forum and uh, to some Guardian Science podcast, and I've got the Guardian Science podcast grade because I haven't given you a reference to it. But go and uh, visit Ver Veritas Forum at Brown, where they talk about can robots become human? Um, much more of the topic of the next talk, but they touch on nudge theory about how uh, organisations can gather so much data about people that they can then go, and people and communities, that they can go and nudge those communities in various directions. Think of this like um, subliminal advertising on steroids. Do you remember, um, uh, you know, you could put a, a Coke advertisement in, uh, uh, in every so many frames of a movie picture and then uh, in the, in the um, candy bar uh, intermission and afterwards, the Coke sales would go through the roof. Now, this is highly illegal. And, um, and it turns out to be very, very effective using AI because you can get that much knowledge from that much data. To give a really, really contemporary example of just exactly what the Veritas Forum guys were talking about is the Facebook. Facebook um, uh, let their data be used by Cambridge Analytica and Cambridge Analytica bragged um, uh, how they actually influenced Brexit and the Trump vote. Now, I'm not giving you a position on how effective they were. I am telling you that it makes sense because of how marketers have been using this information uh, for years and years and years. I don't know the details of this. You can read a lot about it in the news. But Mark Zuckerberg made a couple of interesting points in his testimony to Congress the last two days. Mark Zuckerberg, uh, CEO of Facebook. And, um, and uh, he pointed out that, in fact, actually it is an arms race so for power against Russia. So he's actually verifying what uh, uh, President Putin actually said in a different context. Not only that, he also said in part of the testimony what we'd all long assumed, that all of the three data agencies in the US have access to all of the Facebook, Twitter, um, data, etc., and uh, so you can um, you can assume uh, that the government there has access to it all. I'll let surveillance go because I'm going to run. I'm running over time, and uh, I just want to give you some implications, uh, prelude to the future. Um, Ravi Zacharias, I don't know if you know, he's a an apologist, and uh, he often quotes uh, Viktor Frankl, who's a two-time survivor of the Nazi death camps. And, uh, and I'm now swapping to, that's where we are, I'm now swapping to, but there's a dialogue that's happening because of what the expectations are for the future. And Ravi Zacharias points out, uh, he uses this quote, he says, I'm absolutely convinced that the gas chambers of Auschwitz, Treblinka and Maidenek were ultimately prepared not in some ministry or other in Berlin, uh, but rather at the desks and lecture halls of nihilistic scientists and philosophers. Now, I'm not for a second suggesting that anybody involved in AI, uh, at least outside of the military, is trying to do anybody any harm. Um, but this really suggests that what com what's coming through academia, what happens in the university affects culture. And, and the conversations that are happening there today about the expectations, about all the problems that AI is going to solve for us, oh, and by the way, there are some risks that we're seeing too, that conversation is starting to affect expectations today. And it's feeding into the narrative, certainly that our kids are hearing on campus and in, uh, that we're hearing in the workforce, that we don't need God. You know, Christ may not apply because we can solve all of our problems because we're going to have enough intelligence. That's really intriguing. Um, uh, and this is my nearly, uh, uh, what I'm nearly done. Um, uh, that's really intriguing because Secular Magazine Wired uh, had this quote in this article a little while ago. Um, you can look it up, the AI cargo cult. And, uh, and I can read it as best uh, because it really captures what, I was trying to, what I'm trying to convey. Uh, many proponents of an explosion of intelligence 
um, expect it will produce an explosion of progress. I call this mythical belief thinkism. It's the fallacy that future levels of progress, and that's interesting that future levels of progress, which is a direction, that's a whole conversation itself, are only hindered by a lack of thinking power or intelligence. Uh, I might also note uh, the belief that thinking is a magic super ingredient um, to a cure-all, as a cure-all, is held by a lot of guys who like to think. I'd also add, by a lot of guys who are comfortable, never have to be cold, tired or hungry, um, who are very well educated, and uh, this is not describing many of the people I know in East Timor, for instance. What's the point? The point is that that whole conversation about AI and science and technology and mankind being able to pull it up by our own bootstraps, we now have a, a chance to actually say, guys, um, that's actually not right. Because just imagine, as people are right now, that we have unlimited thinking power, and yet what is it already demonstrating about the state of the human heart? Um, you saw Mr Putin there. Money, sex, power. It doesn't, an enormous uh, uh, increase in thinking is not going to change any of those things. And I just think we have an opportunity now to start engaging with our kids, our youth groups, our workmates to actually start pushing back on the narrative that they're healing, uh, hearing. Um, I've sort of given you all the left hand side there. I just have really some quickly thoughts on how to respond. Recognise the rate of change um, is, uh, is increasing. Uh, question how AI is being relied on and start to foster dialogue in the, in the workplace. And take charge of tech in our families. If you've got a 19 year old lad, if you've got a 16 year old lad, uh, he's in his bedroom with his iPhone, you've got a new danger to think about. Um, and uh, particularly lads, by the way, it's not just lads now, increasingly. Um, uh, but biology is. Um, and I think there are some responses that we Christians can, can actually think about. If there is upheaval, if there is uncertainty, I think we have some resources that we can start talking to our culture about. But we need to demonstrate that faith in Christ offers resources such as peace and hope in something beyond ourselves. If we're fearful, if we're nervous, if we're uncertain, we don't, our words are going to ring hollow. Um, uh, and we have a basis for human value beyond work and beyond just what you do. And not only that, if I've demonstrated at all the need for a, a human heart, uh, whether it's in legal, whether it's in healthcare, but you know, maybe after a hundred and something years of being told that man is not unique, maybe AI is just starting to tell us that in fact there is something very unique about mankind. Thank you very much. Um, I would think all of us here would believe that our main goal in life is eternal life. Uh, and so I'm struggling at the moment with, I'm trying to write a book at the moment, about the importance of truth um, as a foundation to be more confident of you know, achieving eternal life. And what you'll find, as you probably know, is there's something like 35,000 varieties of Christianity and that with the internet and everything, we've got a huge amount of evidence. I think I'll see where this is going. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, anyway, but um, just trying to be quick, but um, leading to, um, you know, identifying all the errors that have crept in over the last 2,000 years. And, uh, you know, it's just a massive amount of error. And so people like me can sort of, don't have responsibilities for running congregations, etc. can come into a huge amount of truth, but that the mainstream church people won't go anywhere near it. They're just not interested in the change. So in my mind, that you know, what's really more and more the case in our society is that, that there's human unintelligence as compared to sort of machine growing intelligence. And um, I'd love to think there was some way that this could be solved by providing evidence that you know, people will absorb, but it just uh, doesn't seem to work that way. People just are totally illogical in many ways and just don't seem to take things on board. So you're saying, could we actually apply uh, 
AI to answer the big questions in life. Yeah, yeah. Um, I. <laughs> well, well, actually, you're really spoiling you're really spoiling it because if I get to uh, to have uh, part two of this talk, I have a reference there as my Don't last worry, slide. You won't get a yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a reference to that very question on my on my last slide, and in fact, I decide I won't give that away right now. But um, uh, I can tell you what I did see uh, last week or the week before, um, and it's a pity Matt's not here because. Um, uh, they were, there's, and I can't remember where it was in Israel, but there were lots of fragments of different documents actually scattered throughout the world and they weren't sure which fragments uh, are actually um, correlated to which documents. And with AI and the images, they were actually able to retrofit these documents and actually read the whole historical document by actually looking at the paper, the words, the and actually um, using AI techniques to reconstruct the the ancient documents, and if I take a note, I can actually find that uh, it's a YouTube video and uh, that I watched from one of the universities, and and I can post that on the uh, on the Facebook page. So in terms of getting a historical truth, I think the answer might be a likely yes. In terms of interpreting. Uh, what we've already been given, uh, um, uh, gee, I, I don't even know if I want to comment on that really. That seems to be, uh, but I tell you, it's a really interesting question, but I, it's not one that I've considered. Uh, no, that, it relates so closely to technology. Um, it does, it is really interesting to look at the makeup of the data that we've got. And again, I, I quote IEEE, you know, the folks who give you Wi-Fi and, and Bluetooth, engineering organisation looking at the data standards that go uh, into the AIs. I think that's a really interesting thing to look at right there. Um, but could we interpret biblical truth using an AI? I, I you know, I'll consider, I, I have to think about that. I really do. No, but like, like philosophical issues too, um, going through the, all the logic that they argue about and obscure arguments, would, could it possibly be applied to unravel that sort of thing? You know, the, the danger um, that occurs to me here is a bit like the, the Jesus seminar, right? Where you sort of go and vote and take the most probable things that, got, uh, that Christ said okay. or didn't say or whatever. And, and that's where I worry about the data and the reliability of the data that we fed. But, I'm, I'm trying not to actually ask you a question because I have to really think about it. I, I think that's a really interesting question, um, is, but is I, it, I don't is know. It's up though the distinction between knowledge and intelligence because what's happened is they've been blurred. And, and a lot of what you talk about as artificial intelligence is, is in some respects advanced knowledge and the ability to combine it. Is it really intelligence in the sense that you can raise that reasoning capacity yeah, I mean, I know you talk about that, there is increasing reasoning to it, but there's still some elements, I think, of human intelligence that you know, are absent from the AI, and will they ever be achieved is obviously an important question. So I'm trying not to, I'm trying to leave you uh, wanting part two, um, but, but, but simply, simply put, as I was just talking to Yen and, and, and Tim, um, one of the, the assumption from the, um, from the scientists, particularly the particle physicists, right, um, is that, uh, and, and essentially anybody who's a materialist, i.e. the universe and the matter and the energy is all that has ever existed, and whether you believe in multiverses or whatever, that's all that's ever existed, right? So matter comes first and then eventually we get mind, uh, we get brain. And mind is not separate from brain, right? It, and it, and it turns out that what the what all of the naturalists and materialists would argue and do argue vociferously is that um, mind is simply an arrangement of of particles, subatomic particles, right? And the assumption is to get to the right hand corner of that diagram I show you, the artificial general intelligence and the superintelligence is as soon as we figure out um, from our neuroscience and our from our from our particle physics how we actually arrange the particles, then we'll create a mind and we'll actually have unlimited intelligence. 
Now I think that fails right out of the gate, of course, because I'm a dualist. I don't think that I think mind preceded matter um, rather than matter preceding mind. But that is the assumption that's being out there. So, so then you start to get into well, what is knowledge? What is intelligence? And the the canonical example to try and and differentiate between a real human mind, right, and what the AIs are giving us, which is knowledge of a form, but it's not a mindful knowledge. If if the, Is it the just the application of principles that we give to it? No. The, 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 the example given is if you had somebody who didn't understand Chinese and you fed them in messages and they had every sort of Chinese textbook and they could look it up and they could decode it and then pass it back, the message back in English, mm. right? Do they really understand Chinese? Even if they could translate every single sentence you'd ever give them, but do they actually understand Chinese? Mm. And that's the analogy that's used for artificial intelligence. There's not really a mind to mm -hmm. understand in the same way as we humans do at this stage. The question is open though, if you're a materialist and we get to super intelligence, would there actually be that mind? Would there be a self and would there be a consciousness? Hmm. Can, can I ask? Um, our relationship to ants in terms of intelligence, I mean, we, we don't really care what they do under the ground with all their nesting and so on because we are super intelligent compared to them. So when AI becomes super intelligent, it's, not, it's going to be so far above us and beyond us, it's going to have no need for us, it's going to have no, no use for us. And it's going to just look at us at, like ants and... And it'll become useless to us, but it also won't care about us. It'll realise it's got no goal, it's got no need to conquer or, or to destroy. Or That's certainly one of the risks and the narratives that the, the physicists and the researchers are actually uh, uh, coming about. And this is what I'll cover on part two. Um, and very, uh, very, right, simply put, very, very simply put, very, very simply put, that's the... That's the, our open. That's our open door to have uh, talks about religion and, and theology with our workmates because people are actually growing uneasy with exactly that with exactly that prospect. Sam Harris uh, has a great TED talk on this. That's right. Yeah, um, my, my question is around um, nobody sort of or you didn't raise it. Perhaps it's part of uh, part two. Is um, to me you can the, the intelligent part is not the issue. It's whether the, com the computer can become, or the robot can become self-aware. Because that, I think that's what distinguishes us from something else. So if a computer starts thinking and knows it's a, of its existence, as opposed to just modifying an algorithm by the initial program that we put in, um, that's when it becomes... Could it become self-aware? Yeah, well, self-awareness is the, is, the, is the critical thing to me. And, and, and this is now being talked about. You know those conversations that I talked yes. about that are starting to leach into the into the current based on, on, on future expectations. The expectation from the scientists and the secularists and the researchers is that we will get to that point where we will actually create a consciousness. Now I disagree with that because I think mind is not just an arrangement of matter. I think mind and brain are separate. But that is not the secular world, that is not the academic view. The academic view is predominantly, strongly, overwhelmingly that we are just an arrangement, that mind and self and consciousness is simply a product of brain states. The other way they argue on that is to say that um, mind and consciousness are not real, they're an illusion. So um, we think we have consciousness, we think we have self-identity, yes. but it's an illusion. Yes. Because that's the other conclusion from materialism, because the materialism would say these yes. things cannot exist. Yeah. Yeah. What the materialists will never acknowledge either is that we're made in the image of God. All human beings are made in the image of God. <coughs> so that it, it, the whole spiritual dimension is left out of it. And none of us addresses that. You can get intelligent, you can even get self aware. But it's not going to address the issue that we're made in the image of God. And therefore, to have that intelligence that God has designed is a very different thing to what AI is doing. So, so there are two problems with consciousness. There's an easy problem and there's a hard problem. And the hard problem, people basically even very sceptical about whether they could actually solve the hard problem. The hard problem is, what's it like to be 
uh, well, in, in the words of Thomas Nagel, what's it like to be a bat, right? What's the experience like that self? What, what is, and, and by the way, uh, do other minds actually exist? What proof do we have that other minds exist, right? Um, you could all be just an illusion in, in, in my mind, right? I have no proof. There's no way I can prove that any of your other minds actually exist. Now, it's getting really deep into the philosophy, but that's sort of where we're headed. So even with an awareness, and even with an awareness level that folks like Peter Singer, um, an atheist ethicist from, um, I can't remember, you know, he's the guy that basically is happy to, you know, kill babies three months after they're born, um, but he wants to have uh, uh, he wants to have equal rights for clones and for um, uh, and for AI selves, um, and uh, not MIT. He's at he's at Princeton, and and he lectures in this stuff in ethics, and you can hear him on uh, on the um, uh, uh, on the um, I've just lost the, uh, what's the, Ted, was it? no, 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 not the TED Talk, the, um, oh, you come back to me in a minute, I'll give you a, a link to it. Um, but uh, 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 one, of the, one of the science podcasts that I actually referenced earlier, um, but even though there's an awareness, is it still like that interpreter for the Chinese? Is it giving every impression of being a mind and a self, but it's still not really um, aware, it doesn't have an experience of I am, I exist. And that's the hard uh, issue of consciousness. And frankly, both the neuroscientists and the AI researchers aren't sure even where to start with that one. Yeah, because I mean, we've got a new version of Word that we've written, and it's, it's actually now prompting me to correct my English. You know, it's not just simply saying, join the ants together, it's actually suggesting an alternative technical solution. And sometimes it's right, sometimes. <coughs> Sometimes, yes, it's right, it's actually short and trying to reverse us, but other times it actually changes the meaning. It, just, it doesn't imply the subtle meaning that I'm implying by what I said. So that says to me that there is a difference, um, that the machine will never be able to learn that, or if it does, it'll have a different perception. Well, it'll have a different perception, but hang on. I was listening to Ray Kurzweil, who's the inventor of the music synthesizer, um, um, and uh, the flatbed scanner, and he's a futurist. He actually sold his companies to Google. So he works on Google DeepMind. Now, Google DeepMind, the folks that bring you AlphaGo, if you go and look up Google DeepMind, you'll find their goal is to solve intelligence. They want to get to that right-hand top, uh, uh, left-hand corner, up that side, right? Um, they want to get up to that artificial generate. Why? Because there's power and there's money in it. And that's what they're working hell for the leather to do. Now, I was listening to him, um, and anybody can do this. MIT have a course on AI, and they have, and this is an online course for their lectures. And I was listening to this guy actually talk um, about, um, about AI, and he gives reading comprehension. He talks about where we were 20 years ago, that basically the, the reading comprehension algorithms could understand to the you know to a toddler to a two or three year old well a grade two or grade three level and and uh, about 10 years ago they could do to sort of like a young kid level and he said just recently the comprehension of the AI engines using a couple of the um, uh, uh, latest uh, techniques and he mentioned a couple brack propagation and some technical terms um, and he said they've basically almost come to adult level and he's seeing now a, a, a very steep rise in, in that very example, in the actual reading comprehension, which is a really fascinating thing. If we have real-time language translators, like Apple released and demonstrated uh, late last year, does anybody else here think of the Tower of Babel story like I do when I hear that? Um, I don't see that as a... Uh threat other than, uh, well sorry, I look at it as um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge to us, it's like Hillary Count climbing Mount Everest, it's actually there, it's how we, you, you, I think you did it really well, you pointed out the problems and we must, like when they, when they invented the, the, um, the bomb, okay, somebody said the genie's out of the bottle, now, um, that's the same situation here, the genie's out of the bottle, but 
is how we control it. And, and then... and, and absolutely, and that's my purpose for sort of raising this. When I, I started, I heard a, a Guardian Science podcast weekly. That's the, that's the podcast. I heard about 18 months ago, I heard them talk about how to actually try and give morality to an AI, assuming that it was going to create self and, and become aware and all that sort of stuff. And I went, who's morality? And I went, oh my goodness. This is such a powerful proof for the evidence of a creator and a mind being before material. Because um, if you have relative morality, who's, who's morality? And if it's just relative, how will it not just destroy itself? And, and I just thought, and part two is largely an apologetic, so it won't be... I, I tried to do this for a secular audience so I can show some of my friends at work and stuff like that. Um, but the next part I don't think can be... And, and the point and the important part of what you're just saying is let's not be afraid. The genie is out of the bottle, but guess what? This is where we can introduce our faith and our meaning and our purpose conversations back into that technology that's already running away without those conversations. Oh, it would be, be interesting because I, um, I, I take a slightly different view in the sense that I think um, our, our concerns are, are um, shared with 95% of the population. <coughs> Absolutely. So therefore, we have to be careful. I think they're allies, not, um, not enemies. But that's what, oh, sorry, that's exactly what I was saying, Rob. Uh, um, that, that this gives us, instead of uh, the combative nature that we've actually had over pretty much every topic, mm -hmm. guess what? We're in the same universe with the same AIs as our secular professors. And all of a sudden, we have a joint need. Whereas all of the secularists have been dismissive <coughs> of the church, and the church, and the capital C church, has been either ignorant or done right fearful of science and technology. And this is, uh, I believe this is a really, uh, really opportune time to have shared dialogue. So uh, uh, if you heard something opposite from that, please let me correct that. But I, I think it's an opportunity for dialogue rather than anything else. Um, I have no serious talk there is going to see if, if um, Kevin and Raj are different. <laughs> see, the next step is where we merge machine and man. Part two. It's where we can actually Part download... Two. That's called program. Tram. That's you know, that. into the future, it's going to come to a time where we can actually download knowledge. We can actually get to the point where we can download and blank out God. I, I don't know. So it's a bit like, you know, where that's where things really start to blur because, you, you know, know, what's the artificial intelligence? Well, our own intelligence and what is our own soul. So, part two um, if you look on seek.com, you'll find that Elon Musk has got six positions open in San Francisco for a company called Neuralink and it is actually to try and um, have a different interface uh, between machine and man is to actually try and create that interface and there was a transhumanism party that actually contested the last US congressional and presidential elections and the transhumanism uh, actually transhumanism which is largely morphing into man and machine augmentation Again, this is part two. I just couldn't fit everything in part one. It, it, is a discussion. It's not only, I guess it's not only uh, man and machine augmentation. You can then start looking at other beings, other species as implanting intelligence into them. Um, super horse. Had, super. Haven't thought, thought about that. But, but the whole topic of augmentation and transhumanism is actually a growing one and it's part of the larger conversation. Obviously, we're opening up topics here that obviously, without setting the foundation, it was going to be really difficult to actually try and talk about both. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. He's my friend, so I'm going to speak. <laughs> well, thank you for the discussion. Um, supposing we get to the top right-hand corner and we've made the sort of a homo deus in, um, in, in silicon, right? You know, the, the self-aware yep. thing that's yep. all to me. Do you think it would pray to God? And do you think that God would listen? Um, that's actually an article in Christianity Today. Um, uh, on, I, on, my, <laughs> on, on one of my early slides, and, and even the Pope, I think, has actually weighed into this about how we should actually approach such a topic. Um, my, um, well, if, you, if you wouldn't mind putting that one out in your slides, I'd be fascinated to actually read on that. 
Um, yeah, I can give you a, a, a link oh, to it or a one. way to, um, um, and I'll, I'll post the slides so you can get everything. I've tried to reference everything, so it just wasn't. Yeah, no, no, you know, like who's who, who's this? Some guy from you know, uh, some pro supporter from Largs Bay website, talking about AI. Yeah. So yeah. I'll post them there if you're happy for me. What was the argument? It is an argument, not a conclusion. Yeah. Well, what was, did they decide that yes, it would actually They decided be. it's a good question. And we were <laughs> <laughs> See, a lot of these technologies can actually be linked, like radio frequency identification chips, which we all got on us, really. We've got a credit card, we've got a radio frequency identification chip. You know, you can, down, you can download whatever information, and that's only the start. America's now injecting them underneath the skin. The future is... Yeah, that guy got put in jail, though, by the way. You know, we're starting to get into cashless society is on the horizon you know it's it's we are more you know, connected and that's the whole bit about control things are actually starting to link up technology different fields you know this cloud technology all consciousness you know all getting your information from a central there's a date you know what we're actually saying there's actually danger bells ringing in lots of different ways where it can be used for the good and what it can be used for the bad and it's ultimately if the if you know these people are trying to get all consciousness because they want all <coughs> power, which is sorry, we don't need so many humans, we can eliminate ninety percent. You know, we can colour colour herd, you know, we can make godlike decisions. This is where we're going. This is what the Georgia Guidestones in America were basically they're making twelve different statements where basically the world's population is the goal. Uh, we only need 90 percent, 10 percent of the work. You know, we're starting to create philosophies. It's right out there. Oh, we started creating philosophies thousands of years ago. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say that. And, there's, 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 and some things aren't new. Like, well, what is what is new are the tools, the sophistication of the tools. Yeah. Sorry, so, Tony. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say a few examples of the way technology has changed us in recent times. One is our attention spans have become really short. People don't read books as much as they used to. Sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> Another one um, is that, uh, for example, boys um, in late primary school are becoming addicted to pornography because it's in their, on their phones in their pockets. It's, it's not just boys. And what happens when they grow up um, and they're adults? How are they going to treat women? And another example is even when I go to the football now and watch, um, watch games with dad, we now can't, as of this year, buy anything with cash at the football. Everything has to be by credit card. Mm. So these are three, just three quick ways of, of how technology is changing human <clears throat> behavior in just recent years. Now, with the rise of AI, our AI will be able to manipulate human behavior more and more. What kind of ways do you believe that our behavior might be subversively and subconsciously manipulated in the future? Oh, it already is. No, but I'm talking about with the rise. Well, with of AI. the rise, well, the nudge theory. I haven't, um, uh, I haven't gone into that as deeply uh, as I I might. In fact, well, although we're getting it presented on our news for, uh, on our um, news right at the moment, um, and and they will eventually, I think, because of how high profile it is, I'll get to how efficient or inefficient, how much they actually did affect or not affect um, uh, the voting. Um, but uh, I, the thing that gives me pause is I don't, beyond trying to get and raise the conversations, I actually don't know what to do. Mm. Um, and, and I'm looking to raise the conversation, particularly within the, uh, 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 communities of faith, because I actually don't know the answer. And, and by the way, when I talk to my friends, uh, uh, some of who are in uh, Austin, uh, uh, there's a friend of mine who I've been working on this presentation um, and uh, he's in um, Massachusetts. His son is the Republican ambassador for, uh, for MIT um, and, he, and he's looking at AI and he's a Christian and he's making the same observations that I am. I'm going, tell me where I'm wrong that this is not going to be profound. Mm. Tell me what to do about it. And, and the answer is yes, it is going to be profound. All of my workmates are saying the same thing, i.e. all the, my technical workmates, secular and, and not. And, um, but we don't quite know what to do. So I'm, a, I'm open to ideas. Yeah. I, 
Uh, by the way, what, what are some of the tools, what are the, the AI tools? Like there used to be a rule-based language years ago. Um, With Snowball, I think was one of them, wasn't it? Was it Snowball? Pat Pat Snowball, yeah, Pat uh, the, and there's a standard set of languages? Um, and most of the, so TensorFlow is one of them that comes out of, uh, um, uh, I think it's a Google tool is TensorFlow. So anybody and, can get it and use it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Everything is available. Uh, uh, Elon Musk and uh, a lot of the guys, there's something called OpenAI. You can go and get the algorithms and uh, Udemy and uh, Safari. I'm actually half the way through a Safari uh, web data AI course uh, that my work signs up for. Um, and uh, it basically, seriously, anybody can actually pick it up and start learning it if they're half, half savvy. Mm. A lot of robotics are actually using fuzzy logic, where they're actually map out, you know, there's certain obstacles in between here and there, and they'll work out a thousand or a million different combinations. So you're going to hit a chair here, you're going to and they'll work out the best combination to get from A to B, which is fuzzy a, a, logic. A lot of it is which, probability you know, based, that's true. They're combinations of the perfect reality of, of, of the task, which is basically fuzzy logic, which that, that's, that's, that's 50 year old technology. That, that's way back. Yeah. Sorry, Rob. Well, one of the things, oh, this is more of a comment, is that I'm actually more concerned for civilization as we know it, when the whole thing crashes. Uh, are we heading for the equivalent of the Roman crash of the Roman Empire? Revolution. Because we're so well, no, I'm not, and I'm not a, I'm not an end of the world person. So, okay, so don't get me wrong. I'm saying um, that we are so reliant on the technology, and people haven't talked about the fact that this all this stuff requires maintenance and people, etc. So it, it's all like this. Uh, this technology is going to last forever. It doesn't require circuits don't burn out, and they need repairing. So it's not like it's going to, it's, it's not self-perpetuating. If the knowledge is all in the computers and the knowledge how to make that bit of steel perfect is in the computers, then when it crashes, uh, it will crash probably, yeah. or if there's not enough backups, then civilization's in a mess. Yes and no. Let me give some examples. So I work on OpenStack cloud software, and OpenStack is one of the uh, leading cloud platforms for actually enabling um, people to do cloud within their organisations when they don't want it owned by mm. somebody else. And um, I've been to a few uh, few presentations. I've been lucky enough to go every six months to the conferences where, where they, wherever they are. That's how I got to hear the Cambridge folks. Um, and a number of uh, countries and municipalities are actually starting to use AI to actually do self-healing. And it's not the self-healing that we've had in IBM or in, or in hardware or whatever before. This is different. It doesn't answer all of your question because the really interesting thing is what happens if we run out of power or have some massive glitch or something like that? Absolutely. It's a really so good I'm question. Really particularly if nothing's on paper. Enough. Particularly that if nothing's on paper, right? That I can destroy the cloud enough times that it's crashed and the whole economy falls in a hole. And, and we need to recover as a, as a group. So the, the, the best example I can give of that is... Uh, uh, um, you know how many formats you've actually had on your computer from big disks to little disks to USBs now to uh, uh, stateless devices. So the really interesting thing is in 150 years time, how do you read radioactive? I think that's to your point, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. And that's a really good question. Yeah. It's a really good, I, I yeah, don't have an answer for the, it. The people, um, what was the um, Australian thing, uh, Mad, Mad Max, okay, we headed for Mad Max. I, I don't want to go there, but... John, uh, last week... Yeah, Tom, uh, somewhere between horror and fascination. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's appropriate, isn't it? <laughs> um, quantum computing would move you swiftly towards the, uh, the right-hand side of your screen, I take it? Um, we think so. It's showing every likelihood and promise uh, of doing so. Sorry, what sort of computing? Uh, quantum computing. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, three... Brown, one blue, or three blue, one brown. Um, they actually have, is a maths uh, channel on YouTube, and they have some of the best explanation of quantum computing uh, that I've actually seen, as, as well as things like blockchain and AI and a few other things. Um, three blue, one brown. Uh, uh, if you look that up, um, you'll actually see how quantum computing is actually different. But essentially, um, you can do a vast array of things at the same time, rather than one after the other. Yep. Mm -hmm.
uh, and therefore uh, it could be closer than we think to. I, again, if you're like me and you think that mind precedes matter, then there's some fundamental divergence on those uh, materialists who think that we can just arrange matter to actually create mind. The percentage mind. of powerful people who think that the new AI is God and invest, mm. uh, and invest it, you're in trouble, aren't you? Um, I mean, it, we, don't, we can skip the whole ethical anxiety of it. If a group of powerful people decide that it's enough of a god to, to let it loose, well, except for um, you know, if that was well, I'm going to quote G.K. Chesterton uh, from Ravi, via Ravi Zacharias once again. You've got to remember that there's about five times in history that Christianity has gone to the dogs, and each time it's the dog that's died. And that, yeah, well said. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll finish up on that. So, thank you very much for the talk.